everybody, this is Serena. You're watching Now It's So Vivid. And today's video is going to be sort of a tribute to my new muse. His name is Cecil Williamson, and he created the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic in Boss Castle, Cornwall. So, so I became fascinated with this gentleman, Cecil Williamson, when I visited the museum on my honeymoon a few months ago. Um, the place itself is fascinating, but it's not a very impressive building, if you ask me. It seems very normal and quite small, but is not in want of information by any means. It is chalked to the brim <laughs> with magical artifacts and um, is very sort of rich and complex, and there's plenty to interact with and read, so you could easily spend like an entire day. And it's not at all expensive, um, if I recall correctly, so um, it's terribly affordable, and I do plan at some point to put together a video of all of the witch-friendly places that I visited in the UK, and that is one of them, but I, <laughs> I kind of overwhelmed myself with footage, so eventually you guys will be able to see um, the inside of the museum, or parts of it anyway, and um, I, I, I was just so impressed with this place, and it, it reignited a lot of um, passion for study of witchcraft that I felt had gone dormant for a while. Um, it definitely rekindled my love of tarot because I was fascinated by their tarot display there. And um, it also just intrigued me because this man, Cecil Williamson, pretty much devoted his entire life to bringing um, all of his research on this subject of witchcraft to the public. Uh, he was fascinated by it ever since he was a small child. He recounts a tale of being a very young boy and coming to the defense of an old woman who was being accused of witchcraft by uh, the sort of local villagers in Devon when he was going to visit some family there. And it turns out the woman that they were harassing was a witch and she decided to teach him some witchcraft. And then ever since then he would no matter where he went, get to know like the sort of wise women of the area, and he was very um, hands-on, and he would uh, go and meet these people and sort of communicate with them in a very intimate way, and uh, just sort of nurtured this love of witchcraft throughout his entire life. Um, he even lived in Africa for a time at a tobacco farm. I guess he had tried to become a priest, and his dad was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> go do something important with your life. Go farm tobacco. So uh, he lived there for a while, but then, you know, got to know the village which is there, too. So he was, um, he was always seeking out this knowledge. And then during World War II, after having a brief career in the movie industry in Britain, he worked for the British Secret Intelligence Service as a spy and used his occult knowledge to thwart the Germans and, uh, you know, implant some falsified Nostradamus prophecies <laughs> that would trick them into leaving Germany, and that's how they arrested one of Hitler's deputies or something. It's fascinating. Fascinating life. And um, after the war, was very interested in using his cumulative knowledge of witchcraft to open a research center and a museum. Um, it was something that I, he thought that he would be very good at because he considered himself a showman and he thought of a, a museum as a perfect uh, parallel to um, entertainment and, and the movie industry that he had experience working in to give this knowledge that he'd collected to the public, um, but this was at a time in the UK when, you know, it was taboo to, like, talk about witchcraft. It was, witchcraft, the practice itself was still illegal then, so, you know, he was ambitious in a way, and, you know, as, as you'd expect, the common folk did not take too kindly to him doing this, and, you know, time and time again, he was run out of town on a rail because, you know, people were not okay <laughs> with um, this information being made public. They, they thought of it as evil. So he stole away to the Isle of Man and um, opened the official first incarnation of uh, the Witchcraft Museum, I believe in the 50s. And when he opened his doors, who came to live with him and work with him but Gerald Gardner, the founder of Wicca. Um, at this point, I think they had been formal acquaintances. I, I think they just knew each other um, through mutual contacts in the occult world. 
And then uh, he recounts <laughs> Gardner as having very little knowledge of museums or witchcraft. <laughs> and uh, there's this sense of Gardner relying very heavily on Williamson to educate him and to you know, introduce him to people and to drive him around. I guess Gardner didn't have a car, so you know, he was dependent on Williamson for so many things, and it grated on Cecil Williamson over time. And uh, their relationship sort of developed in a very volatile way, <laughs> where um, they were con there was constant contention between them, where Gardner wanted Cecil Williamson to join his covens, and Williamson wasn't really interested in being part of a group, and certainly not a group that <laughs> Gardner was involved with. I think at this point he just didn't really care for him very much, and uh, he would blow him off constantly and say stuff like, my wife won't let me, you know what I mean? Like, it was very passive-aggressive. And then, um, <laughs> there's in the book that I bought at the museum on uh, Williamson's life, um, it's a book by Steve Patterson called uh, Cecil Williamson's Book of Witchcraft. And in this book, uh, there's this hilarious anecdote where, uh, when they broke up, <laughs> so to speak, um, they had been like sort of fighting over, Gardner wanted Cecil Williamson's list of contacts from working with the Secret Intelligence Service, and of course he wasn't going to give it to him for, for several very obvious reasons, you know, those, those could have been confidential. Um, but, you know, they fought over it so much that um, Williamson decided he just wanted to move back to England in an act of just like petty aggression went into their kitchen and like peeled all of the witch stickers off of their crockery <laughs> and then uh, this incensed Gardner so much that he lunged at his friend with an athame and then the two men went their separate ways and that's uh that's almost a direct quote from the book actually because I, I read it over and over again so many times <laughs> But it's hilarious to me, and it, it perfectly describes these two men and their two personalities um, in, in a way that I find very telling. Cecil Williamson was, um, for as much as he liked to call himself a showman, a private person, and he wasn't interested in being in the limelight. He wanted his work to be in the limelight. That's what, that's the success that he wanted. That's the legacy he wanted to leave behind. Um, Gardner, on the other hand, was interested in the fame and the glory and the influence, um, and, uh, you could say wasn't quite as serious about it as Cecil Williamson was, especially if he's willing to, like, try to stab his friend with this athame, this ritual tool that's not supposed to draw blood. I think that can tell you all you need to know about how seriously Gardner really regarded Wicca or, or witchcraft in general, um, and it came from a very self-centered place. Um, I don't particularly like Gerald Gardner myself. Um, I think he tried to use Wicca as a vehicle for his sexual proclivities, which is another thing that Cecil Williamson did not like about him. Um, I think the voyeurism really turned him off. He was also just not a fan, in general, of ceremonial witchcraft. It wasn't really his style, and I think that has a lot to do with him um, uh, just sort of favoring the perspective of folk witches and traditional witchcraft. You know, that's the that's the brand that he sort of grew up with and grew to love. So um, when it came to like, you know, waving swords around or dancing around naked, I feel like he just thought of that as kind of extra. And um, I, I can sort of relate to that in a way. Um, I have used ceremonial magic in my practice and to great effect, but for the most part I tend to streamline my practice. I've definitely honed down my preparatory activity for ritual because when I want to cast a spell, I want to cast it like right now and if I have to take five minutes to like draw the circle and call the quarters and do the pentagrams and yada yada yada, um, I just feel like that's really extraneous and uh, it's often very distracting and time wasting for me because like I said, I already have an idea of what I want to do when I'm going in. So uh, I, I tend to, you know, sort of lean towards that side. But I still sort of fall in the middle somewhere because I do utilize um, ceremonial ritual. But uh, it wasn't really of interest to Cecil Williamson at all. Um, I can also relate to him because he was an animist. Um, I will link in the description to this great podcast of uh, Steve Patterson who wrote that book. Um, talking with, I believe, the publisher of the book? I'll have to double-check that. But anyway, in that 
interview, uh, Steve Patterson talks about how Cecil Williamson would, you know, talk to the items in his home, his kitchen appliances, you know. He was, he was very interested in the spirit world and with connecting with uh, the spirit world through um, the sort of tactile, mundane world around us. He knew that this was only really a veil for what was to come next after we died, so uh, in that way I can deeply sympathize with him because I consider myself an animist. Um, I feel the spirit in every, like, sort of inanimate object in my house. You know, in that way, I, I totally get where he's coming from. I. It, it just feels very natural to me, and in a way I really relate to him. And in another way, he's kind of my muse, because he he's sort of inspired me to, you know, get back to my studies and, and uh, do research and really be sort of like uh, hands-on and get dirt under my fingernails kind of thing. And uh, I think I really needed that kick in the pants to like sort of get back into gear, because for a while, uh, and this happens to me occasionally, but my practice goes dormant and <laughs> gets dusty, and um, Cecil Williamson was really exactly what I needed in order to, uh, to get back to work, because um, I tend to let things get stale after a while, so I can thank him for that too. So this is my testimony. I, I want him to be more famous than he is. Um, I don't know if I'll achieve that alone, but I'm glad that I get to share this newfound love. I'm such a Williamson fangirl now that I'm so happy that I get to share this with you because, like I said, he doesn't get a whole lot of recognition, and um, I want other people to know that I think he is just as influential in what we now know as contemporary witchcraft as any of his contemporaries and he he knew so many of them and uh, interacted with them and shared ideas with them um, not just Gardner but Aleister Crowley he knew Margaret Murray not to mention a great deal of other people whose names I don't know off the top of my head but uh, I still think of him as uh, sort of a very important piece in the larger puzzle of what created neo-paganism today. So, um, like I said, this is my tribute. I hope you have enjoyed. Everybody, I wish you very sweet dreams, and uh, I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.